It's a rainy day in Accra. I hope you're doing well. Um, thank you so much for investing your time with us this Saturday morning. As Kofi said, my name is Ophelia Amoni, um, the financial inclusion expert for digital disruptions. It's a US-based consultant firm that is focused on strategy, product innovation, and research. But I am based in Accra. Um, and today I have the singular honor of moderating this amazing panel on the topic, future of FinTech and digital payments. Um, and we'll really focus on three key themes this morning. Rosie, can you please go on mute? So today we'll be focusing on three main areas under the topic. We'll talk about um, the digital infrastructure and policies that we have in place in Africa. And then we'll open up a whole discussion about digital payments. And then we'll also talk about adoption. Um, what is the adoption rate in, in Africa and what can we do to improve on that? So um, the format for this session is very simple. Um, we'll take a few minutes for our esteemed panelists for today to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about their background in the industry. And then I'll kick off the discussion asking questions that will draw some high level themes and trends about um, what we should be thinking about. And then we'll spend some time um, by opening up the floor to our audience to give them opportunity to ask specific questions to our panelists. And please, when you're typing your questions in the chat board, kindly let us know which panelists you are um, sending the question to so that they're able to um, respond accordingly. So at this time, I would... Um, like to ask Steve to give us a brief introduction, tell us about himself and what he's doing in Rwanda. Hi, everybody. Um, glad to be a part of this conversation. So I'm called Shema Steve. I run a FinTech um, called Exus Limited. And uh, so we're mainly, um, we, we have currently two products. Uh, one is the uh, digital platform for saving scripts. So these are informal saving schemes. So we've developed a digital wallet and, uh, that, that has an embedded digital ledger within the, uh, the, the app. So it's accessible via USSD. Uh, people can, because uh, we target mostly people in rural areas that do not have smartphones or internet. So they pretty much, uh, via short call, they uh, dial and they, they can save, um, get credits. So the way they get credits, they make requests and members within the group uh, can see their requests approve or decline. So it's pretty much um, that. And uh, I think we are the first one to do it in Rwanda in terms of digitalizing uh, those informal saving schemes. We are planning to scale out sort of Rwanda next year and uh, it's been an exciting journey, um, looking at how, um, maybe to give you a bit of an idea, the latest data that we have in 2018, so we had about 47,000 groups. So they are transacting roughly five point something million USD per month in savings. And no commercial banks, at least in Rwanda, handles that kind of you know, li liquidity in terms of you know, savings per month. So this goes to show um, the gap that's in between uh, formal and informal banking. Because it realized in Rwanda we have roughly about 14 commercial banks and a number of other MFIs and SACOs. They're all serving less than 50% of Rwanda's population. Now, the other chunk, they mostly get involved in informal, you know, um, saving schemes or financial schemes. So when we saw that, we say we set up to sort of, you know, create a product that sort of, you know, bridge the gap in between the informal and the formal sector. And this, the way our app is built, it sort of allows 
the whole, you know, this, the way these savings groups are set up. So they first collect savings from within themselves and then they now circulate those savings um, amongst themselves. They set the rules, they know uh, what they, I mean, who gets the money and how much money is supposed to pay. So all these things, it's like a bank, but more or less a community and a former bank down in the village. So, I mean, that's in Rwanda, but if you look across the continent, you have the likes of these schemes, you know, and um, that are mainly being, you know, utilized by informal sectors. So we're looking at the rural population. And obviously you all know that more than 60% of Africa is rural. So that means whoever it is that's, you know, to sort of tap into this um, sector that we call a ticking bomb, you know, they should be thinking about how they can, you know, leverage technology that, you know, brings about, um, you know, um, I don't know, you could call it take into account the social structure, or the social fabric, you know, of the African community, especially within the rural, um, rural sector. So, I mean, our approach has always been simple. Is, uh, instead of doing, going about the copy and test syndrome, we call it around here, you know, looking at things that have worked in mostly in the West and then try to replicate them here. So the idea is pretty much to first, you know, go down in the village, leave town for a minute, go leave, you know, with your grannies and grandpas and your uncles in the village, try to understand and then see some of their pen points that they have and some of the things that they're struggling with. I mean, these people, they save 200 francs per week. That's random francs. So that's less than a dollar mm -hmm. per week. But then if you look in terms of volumes and in terms of the mass, I mean, I just shared the, the five point something million per month in, in monthly savings. So, I mean, it's been an interesting journey. And my hope, at least in this conversation, is um, for all of us involved in this sector to sort of, uh, we have bankers, we have people in the, probably I suppose in the startups, you know, sector, we have people in different sectors here. And the question should be more about how do we create solutions that, you know, focuses or the, that, that address the mass, you know, which is the rural, you know, as far as Africa is concerned. So that's what we've been doing. Um, it's, it's been a bumpy road, but, uh, with, um, you know, we have over 30,000, 36,000 users now, and the number is still growing, and we hope to achieve a million by next year. And uh, yeah, so in a nutshell, that's, uh, that's about me. I don't know if I did a good job or a terrible job. I don't know. You tell me. You'll be the judge. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. It's really interesting. Yeah. An exciting time for you and your company in Rwanda, and it's really exciting for us to know what's happening on the other side of the continent. So I guess by the time we finish, we'll be able to compare to see how Ghana is doing versus Rwanda and maybe exchange some ideas as well. Yeah, Ghana is in our radar, by the way, in terms of our scale, you know, scaling plans. So next year, we should, you know, we should be looking at the number of prospects over there. Now I've got a number of friends in Ghana and I hope today my list of friends in Ghana is just going to grow. <laughs> exactly. That's good. Glad yeah. to have you. Um, so we'll, we'll move on to um, Claude from Dream Over. Claude, are you online? Good morning. Hi, good morning. Hello. Hello, Claude. Good morning. We just wanted to, you to give us a brief introduction and tell us about your company. Sure, sure. Thank you. So my name is Claude Kweku Hachfo. I'm a co-founder and CEO at Dream Mobile Limited. Um, Dream Mobile Limited is a technology company that we created back in 2007 to lead the, the, the frontiers when it comes to digital banking and digital transactions. Over the years, I mean, we started in a period where there wasn't much infrastructure. I think 2007 may have been the year, or it was the next year that the iPhone um, was released. So, you know, we, we've been very strong advocates and have always believed in a, in a future where everything could be done digitally. So we, we, from the beginning, have had to build ecosystems that would enable um, electronic payments and digital transactions to happen. 
And over the period, um, we currently process uh, millions of dollars in transactions in different currencies. So for US dollars, Ghana CDs, Zimbabwe dollars. And we also work with major financial institutions, government agencies and merchants to simplify the transactions and streamline the, what you call it, their collection processes, right? Um, at Dream of our, we, we, you know, we sort of believe that the banks let us down and it, it kind of makes sense, right? For each revolution, there will be new players that will come and, you know, innovate on top of existing systems. But um, we, we sort of think of our, you know, our strategy really is to do this through partnerships, right? So to be that innovation partner that can enable these banks that already have these infrastructures and, and, and clientele to digitize quickly. So we have a product called SlidePay that we operate and run in collaboration with Stambik Ghana and Stambik, and Stambik Bank Zimbabwe. And that product basically, you know, it's a mobile app available on multiple channels. So, so there's mobile app, USSD, that allows people to create wallets Right. So in some cases, I, I tend to think of SlidePay as a mobile money solution, right? Just that the strategy is more aggregating of, um, in addition to having the wallet, aggregating other channels like um, card, mobile money into one simple to use um, application that, that will allow you to seamlessly make, uh, you know, do your, your digital transactions. You know, while we're on that journey, we, we also realized a gap within the ecosystem and that had to do with the like reliable aggregation platforms. So we ended up over the period also building our own aggregation platform called Buildbox. And essentially Buildbox um, aggregates uh, merchants, it aggregates payments, and we recently introduced uh, remittances. So we do remittance termination with um, compliance and checks, compliance screening, et cetera, et cetera. And as you know, in Ghana, we, um, Ghana, Ghana has been, FinTech is being regulated in Ghana. Um, and so we have also over the period had to build in place um, controls and mechanisms into our solutions. But just, just as an overview, to give you a sense of what we're doing, um, Monthly, we process about $50 million worth of transactions across all our um, operations. Um, we also have over 5,000 merchants across. Um, we have over 200,000 downloads on our SlidePay platform as well. And we, we continue to push. Um, one, one of the most important things, well, just, just something that I, I learned over the period is that, you know, in, in order to do this, um, to, to push forward with, digital transactions, you needed a complete ecosystem for it to work and for it to be sustained. What, what, what am I saying? So it's one thing to have, for example, on SlidePay payments to a merchant electronically, it solves an interim problem, but for it to be complete, you also need to have the merchant or the, the uh, institution digitized, right? So we did an implementation for um, Meridian port services, um, they, they, they are term, uh, container processing, terminal operator at the Ghana port. And basically before we could even enable them digitally on all our channels, we had to set up a digital platform where their customers could generate invoices electronically before they could then come into our payment system to, to process payments. So those, that, that's some of the challenges that we've faced in the, in the industry. So we've had to, you know, essentially plug in the holes within the ecosystem. But on the whole, um, we, we are advocates for a future where everything is done electronically. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Claude. I'm with you on that. Um, thank you for that great introduction. And we'll move on to our neighboring, our neighbor, um, Adekola is, um, will be joining us from Cote d'Ivoire. He's the head of e-payments at GT Bank Cote d'Ivoire. Good morning to you, Adekola. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm glad to be part of this conversation. My name is Adekola Adereko, and I'm the head of technology, e-payment, and support services in GT Bank Cote d'Ivoire. Okay, in GT Bank Cote d'Ivoire, our focus as a bank is to offer digital solutions to simplify banking operations and payment. Um, this will be done um, gradually by ensuring that we create digital platforms 
that not only meet our customers' expectations, but also offer seamless customer experience to our customers. Um, we're also continually creating strategic partnership and alliances with FinTech across Africa um, to offer remit remittance terminations to mobile money, uh, wallets, and bank accounts across the one zone region. Uh, we have also deployed several digital channels, um, which is USSD Banking. We just launched our USSD Banking recently, and it means that our customers can um, easily access um, or do their transactions with USSD codes. We are also um, we're also pushing payments and ensuring that digital payments is as seamless as possible. Um, so by doing so, we launch a product JTP um, where we do collections um, for embassy schools in, in Cote d'Ivoire. Um, I would like to tell everybody that um, if I the pink text here that um, Digital Cote d'Ivoire is always ready to create um, strategic alliances and partnerships to ensure that um, um, we democratize uh, digital payments across Africa. So we're open to all strategic partnership alliances. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adekla. Okay, so um, right now, I just want us to focus a discussion around digital infrastructure and um, policies. We know that COVID has really pushed digital adoption forward um, in a very short time. It's also shown the disparities between the digital infrastructure across um, Africa, as well as the gaps in adoption and policy. So right now, it's more of a necessity to fast track the adoption of technology. Um, a recent report by McKenzie on Africa in the wake of COVID-19 um, suggested that in order for Africa to expedite it, it, its economic recovery beyond the pandemic, the continent will need to accelerate its digital transformation. So I want to find out from you, um, in your opinion, where are we as a continent on ensuring that we have the right digital infrastructure to meet the increased need for digital services? And if I can start with Steve, Steve, would you be able to share some light on that? So let us know where we are as a continent in ensuring that we have the right digital infrastructure in place to meet the increased demand. Okay. Hello, Steven. Okay, let me let me move to Adekola. Hello, Ade. Uh, hello. Hello. Sorry, I didn't get that. I was just having an interruption. Can you repeat, please? Yes, I was just trying to find out um, what your thoughts are on, on ensuring, um, as a continent, where we are in ensuring that we have the right infrastructure to meet the digital needs of our people. Uh, well, I mean, I'll point out two specific child issues that I think we would need to sort of address before we get to where we want to be. So obviously the most critical one is access to capital or access yes. to funds. And so where you see startups that have solutions that are sort of addressing, you know, issues uh, facing Africa's population. In most cases, people with the money are targeting things that, you know, can be quickly scalable, not just in Africa, but globally. And sometimes they tend not to understand the nature of the African market. So whereby that's, you know, one of the challenges, at least, you know, when you talk to different, you know, entrepreneurs across, across the continent is, you could have the vision to sort of create a product that sort of really impacts and, and then, you know, sparks, I would say, a movement that would sort of benefit generations even, you know, in years to come. But sometimes when you have a meeting with your founders or people with the money, they tend to have, you know, a sort of a disagreement or a mismatch because maybe they do not understand properly, you know, the nature in which you're operating. So that's one. And the second is, 
it comes down now to us as um, you know Africans trying to build solutions that will you know will change the African continent. Now, obviously there are challenges, but for me I always like to focus on solutions, and because challenges are always going to be there. And my suggestion to my fellow entrepreneurs is to always use what you have, be patient, and have a strategy. But then you know have a vision that sort of you know is bigger than just you and then you know be disciplined and then push through so reason i'm saying that is because you know most entrepreneurs whether those that were you know leave here on the continent or those that come back mm -hmm. you find like there's a sort of you know mismatch in terms of context and the solutions that are being developed and um, most of the times they're trying to appeal to the investors people with the money and creating product that you know, people would understand. So you'd find somebody say, I'm creating the WhatsApp of Africa. I'm creating the, uh, you know, for me, I'm not a huge fan of such a kind of you know, analogy, you know. It's just have to be a product that answers needs within, you know, the African continent. So for me, I think those are the two issues that need to be addressed. And obviously the linking bridges, the partnerships. So try, as an entrepreneur, try to see or look for partners that would better understand your vision, be it the short and the long term, and then try to keep focus. Do not lose focus of your um, whatever it is you're trying to do. And um, finally, I think there's a lot of things being done if you look across the continent. I mean, you could start from the companies that are on this panel. I mean, there's a whole lot of stuff that are going on that are happening. So that sort of gives me hope that in you know, the next five to ten years things are going to be completely different from what we used to know five, 10 years back. So there's a movement, that there are things happening, there are people coming back from, from the West, the diaspora, coming to sort of, you know, address some of the issues within their countries. And I feel like, you know, if countries develop, you know, you're gonna have regions and then regions, they're gonna build up on top, you know, to the continent level. So there's good stuff happening. We just need to keep, you know, pushing and then working hard, you know, to create products that our people, you know, enjoy, and then products that make a difference in our, you know, people in Africa. Yeah. Thank you, Stephen. Claude, would you like to just um, add on to what Stephen has said? Yeah, I, 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 I think um, Stephen has said everything, right? Um, his first point on um, capital, right, is 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 really important. We, like I mentioned earlier, we started 13 years ago. Um, in a period where the mobile money was just, I think, a discussion in the boardrooms and stuff like that. And for a young um, startup to, to get access to money that can, actually, that can really propel um, our solutions or our, our incursion forward, that is really difficult. Um, investors are looking for short-term um, investments. They want to see ROIs immediately. Um, that kind of pressure can also make you change your strategy. and mid-flight which which doesn't help at all so you know and and so we we have had to bootstrap because we're holding on to this vision um, dearly and um, it's not easy for us to actually push forth we need a lot of long-term investments people who believe in um, this future that that we we're, we're talking about so definitely the access to capital can can make things change dramatically i mean if we take a MTN Mobile Money, as an example, they threw money at, at, at the mobile money solution, right? They were literally throwing money at it. They had money from a different source of income and they were just throwing money at it. They ran into, for those who know, they, they had challenges earlier on, you know, with um, different, different things. And um, the money is what has made them um, have the largest market share, at least in Ghana and in other places, right? So. We need money and um, it needs to be patient capital. Um, I think that also if we want to um, fast track this, partnerships. I think Steve also mentioned that partnerships are key. Um, you know, banks have um, merchants acquiring machinery, sales machinery, you know, stuff that will be very difficult for a, a, a startup or a, a, you know, a new company in this space to build over time without much money, right? So. If we can leverage partnerships with existing players in the financial space to, to 
you know, transform it, that would also help us. Then again, you know, there's also this challenge of, um, my, my, I think one of my biggest challenges has to do with this uh, cross-border payments, right? Because of how Africa is, right? Um, we, are, we are very, very fragmented. Um, it's not easy to travel to different parts of Africa. So it makes it very difficult to do like a, uh, a cross-border payment solution where you can have people paying from here and there. So that part also needs to be resolved from a policy level from, you know, maybe an AU level, ECOWAS level. Once those things are done policy-wise and the infrastructures like transportation and all whatnot are put in this space. But nonetheless, um, all these challenges are still there and we, we still push forth and it's through these challenges that we innovate. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Claude. Thank you so much. Um, at this point, I think we, it's, it's right to shift the direction to digital payments. Um, cash is like our biggest competitor. Um, and shifting payments from cash into accounts has so many benefits. But for businesses and governments, the challenge is to ensure that digital payments are indeed better than cash, that it's safer, it's more affordable and more transparent. In your mind, how do we empower local payments by developing the right products and services to meet customers' needs? Um, and how to really use product insights to better understand our clients and to tailor make products for their needs? So I think I'll start with Ade. Ade. Hello, Ade. Okay, hello, no, sorry, take that again. I didn't, I didn't get that. I think I had um, network issues. I didn't get your question very well. No, I was asking about how we can empower local payments by developing the right products and services to meet our customers' needs. Okay, um, thanks so much, um, Enoch. Uh, my name is Adekola. Um, and uh, okay, so how we can um, create the right products. Um, basically, like I said initially, um, and I think it's been said by uh, the former speaker, um, we have to really look at um, partnerships. You know, we can't do it all. So with the right partnerships um, and the right mindset, I so much believe that um, we can create the product um, that would delight customers and they'll create um, a good customer customer experience. Um, so looking at partnerships, um, different organizations have different financial assets. So for banks now, we have um, the bank accounts. For the telcos, they have the mobile wallet. And um, the fintechs are aggressive. Uh, it's, a, it's an aggressive space. And you have a um, set of talented people that has a business drive to push as much as possible. Um, I, I wouldn't want to say banks are uh, a bit comfortable, but the fact is that, um, you know, maybe the banks are the bigger player here. So, uh, you know, they come from the comfortable point of view. And um, so it could mean that banks products might not necessarily meet uh, customers' expectation at all times. So um, open up uh, banking APIs um, such that other players can come into play and develop innovative products is a way to go. Um, and I feel with that mindset, um, um, that can assist to create products that will begin to delight customers. But doing it alone, honestly, I'm not seeing it, uh, I don't see it go, go very far, you know? But creating the right partnerships with fintechs around can help and assist create necessary products that will drive financial inclusion and um, ensure that payment is as seamless as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Adekola. Um, I'll just ask um, all participants who want to ask questions to please type in the chat box and to indicate which of the panelists they're um, directing their questions to. 
So if you have any questions for the panelists, please feel free to, to type it in the chat box. I'll pick it up and um, send it to the, ask the panelists on your behalf. So Claude, how are you and Dream Over empowering local payments in yeah. Ghana? Yeah, so and also, yeah. I'm curious to know about um, how you use product insights to get better understanding on how well the products are doing and how you modify or change it around to suit their needs. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, primarily, I mean, we are, we are fintech, um, so we, we do some level of, I mean, in fact, majority of our work is around developing these solutions. And um, we basically are agile, right? So we iterate. I think, generally speaking, um, we, we do like, we have different teams, right? But I think some of the teams run one week sprints. So those are like one week iterations. Um, I think another team runs two week iterations. And we have um, product managers and we have like developers and we have, you know, DevOps, you know, engineers and stuff like that. So primarily the product manager's main goal, role in our organization is to ensure that the right item is being worked on at any point in time. So we, we, we do lots of user research, including especially being very close to our end users, right? Who we allow to, you know, engage us at any point in time. And all of that forms a feedback loop into the solutions that we are building. So that, that, that is, is, is a cultural thing, right? And so for anybody who wants to, you know, build a solution that is meaningful to their customers, you need to, you know, go with the agile approach, right? You need to also set your organization up in a way that the various roles um, complement that goal, right? So culturally, you build based on insights, based on what the customer wants, but it's not just, oh, I want a blue button in the corner of the screen, right? It, it, you need to probe. There are ways of extracting information from your customer to understand what exactly they need. Then of course, there's leveraging of technology. And I think this is where um, it works beautifully for fintechs as opposed to banks, right? Because um, it's easy for us to, to try out new technology that, is, um, that helps in, in, in gathering data than for a bank, right? So if I was, a, if I was in, a, in a bank's um, IT department, I would need to go through all kinds of processes and approvals to get some solution, uh, you know, patches, go through the um, security officer and you know a whole bunch of different things by which time competition would have you know run away with the market so being fintechs we are we, we are in a position to you know innovate try different solutions and there are lots and lots of solutions out there for gathering data on on, on your users and how they use your platforms um, and some are free some are expensive you know and um, so basically, that, that's what we do um, when, when it comes to, to you know, finding our data. So culturally, we, we, our, our organization's operations in terms of our development is agile. So we can get quick feedback loops and, and we can test as we go along. I think that's the, that's the biggest challenge in all of this, right? But for fintechs, we need to do it at a lower cost. For somebody like uh, <laughs> the big telcos, they could just throw money at it, right? But but for us, we need to do it in a bit in a in a in a better way. Yes. yes. <laughs> sounds good. Yeah. Sounds good to me. Um, and what are some of the insights that you've been able to pick up, and how has it influenced some of the changes you've made? Like, can you give us? Okay, so I mean, yeah. So, I mean, definitely for our end users, right? For these payment apps, they 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 really don't like the um what you call the barrier of security right and and that has been a major major challenge for us because we also try to be compliant um and and that has sort of uh, put shackles around our necks right so we we've had to like innovate more right so now you have to enter the realms of like machine learning artificial intelligence you know it, it doesn't make the work simple it makes it more difficult right but um Security definitely, from our user point of view, they don't want to, um, it's like a two-edged sword, right? On one hand, 
everybody is skeptical of fintechs. Who are these guys? Are they working from some small garage or, you know, I'd rather go with a bank. But um, at the same time, to when they try out the solution and you put lots of security implementations around there, you run into issues. And then I think um, another problem that we've had, right? So people like um, the ease of user experience, but then in our part of the world too, I think because we don't have good infra, infra security um, infrastructure, right? So like the, the whole cyber, fraud stuff is not handled well enough by our security um, institutions, right? So our user experience always, you know, has to be toned down a bit because people then try to, uh, what you call it, use it for fraud. I mean, I tip, I'll, I'll give you guys an example, right? So back in 2016, we, we had a, a, a in our app, we, you can load funds into your wallet and we allow people to load funds with mobile money. So you could like enter your mobile money number and then a prompt will come and then you confirm the prompt and people loved it, right? So you would have little um, people who run like conferences or their little businesses use that mechanism to get people to pay them. So you go to them and do it like, go to add funds, enter, select mobile money, enter your phone number, enter the amount, the prompt will come, and then they'll be credited with the amount. That was beautiful. In fact, we didn't intend it, we didn't intend for it to be used like that, but people were using it like that. And guess what? The fraud guys also found great use for it, right? So they would now, uh, what do you call it? Enter some random number, call the person, tell the person from Bologna about, check your balance or something of the sort. And then that was causing problems for us, right? So we had to now introduce like OTPs and a whole bunch of things that, you know, creates friction. So um, security is, is one of the things that I can, I mean, speak about as feedback that we've gotten from our um, customers and something that we continue to innovate around, yeah. Okay, if I may add, um, let me add to, to that. Um, so, okay, also beyond um, the development of our processes, like using an agile to create um, reliable products, I also believe that, um, and what we've been doing is also to leverage your data analytics to understand the pattern of our customers' transactions. Um, and this is what we, what we also use from time to time to build a tailored product that will meet specific needs of, of our customers. Um, so majorly, I believe that um, to, have a, to have the right product, you have to ensure that it's as simple as possible. So um, in as much as security is as important, as it is very, very important, you also also look at the customer experience in building um, mm. a, a very great product. So it has to be a mix of the two. You know, if you, are, you put all the security such that it now becomes very difficult to use, and you know, you start seeing people uh, not using it, and that that would be a great, a great uh, entrance to the to adoption of, of the product. So, like I said, simplicity it has to be as simple as possible, and also you have to also ensure that you have adequate security. And um, data analytics now it's a great tool that can be used to understand customers' need and customers' pattern, transaction patterns especially, and uh, to ensure that uh, the tailored product can be built um, from from this. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Steve, would you like to uh, um, share some insights with us as well on, on your approach for pro developing products and how you measure um, product insights to get a better understanding from your client? Um, yeah, I'm, I pretty much agree what, with what has been said before, but specifically as far as our processes are concerned, so um, again, what we do, you know, human-centered design is really key, uh, is part of our process, and then we definitely give it too much value. So we need to engage with the users. We need to sort of understand their pain points and then try to think, you know, put ourselves in their shoes and then try to understand some of their needs. So, and also the constant engagement when, because our product design process yeah. is, okay. I, and we need to, we always sort of 
you know, we have designers, we have software engineer, we have product support people. So again, it's part of the process to make sure that we understand the needs. We understand what, what solutions, you know, these people are expecting from us. But at the same time, uh, again, back to the partnership point, because you're not only building a product for um, the user. So you have other, as a FinTech, you have other people you're going to need, um, such as banks, such as telcos. You also need to understand how they look at things, their approaches, so that all of those are sort of embedded within your product, so that you don't just build a product and tomorrow when you go in a meeting with a telco or a bank, they do not find it viable as far as they're concerned. So it's sort of a constant engagement with the different stakeholders, obviously putting the users or the customers at the center of the process, but at the same time, not losing sight of other partners because you still need them to make sure that you build a sustainable cycle that sort of can be, you know, uh, followed through all along. So, I mean, pretty much that's, um, they talked about security, which is a very key component as far as you're dealing with people's money, because the moment you innovate, you have other people that are innovating on the other side of the segment. So you've got to make sure you, you stay at the top of your game. And so, I mean, yeah, pretty much a lot has been said before, but again, it's, really that constant engaging of, um, with the customers. But also maybe something that I can add on what has been said is trying to continually improve the skills of your staff because technology is always evolving, you know, and you need to make sure you keep your team motivated and then they know what's happening, you know, like what's in, in terms of new technologies and all that kind of stuff. So you need to sort of, you know, keep them engaged and then um, facilitate to some extent, because now we have a lot of stuff being taught online. So as a company, you could always, you know, give them incentives and then try to sort of, you know, tell them, okay, if we find a course online and then you feel like it's, you're passionate about it, as a company, we can find ways to sort of assist you to acquire such a kind of skills. So there's also that, because technology is not, you can't say that you know everything now because you might know things now, but tomorrow they are obsolete. So you've got to keep continually, you know, learning and, and then, you know, improving your skills. So, yeah, I think that's it. And, um, and yeah, uh, I think the rest has been said. I just don't want to repeat it. But above all, that's what we've been doing. And uh, we feel we, we haven't done enough, you know. And as a startup, you have a small team. You have got, like, thousands of clients, so you can't exhaust. But you you take one step at a time and then as long as the logic and the philosophy is correct you know be that small or larger scale it always makes you know sense that's really great thank you so much and i love the part about improving your skills um everything is changing so fast yeah. you cannot stay um keep old knowledge in a fast changing world um you'll yeah. miss out on something so that's really really great thank you so much um, I think the last topic that we'll discuss today is digital finance adoption. Um, we know that mobile money solutions are out there, there's agency banking, um, we have products out there, savings, credit insurance, but there's still a challenge with adoption. Is it because the products are not the best products for the customers we're trying to target? Is it because they don't have the devices? Is it because there's no internet connectivity? How do we overcome these challenges and increase the adoption of digital finance in Ghana? Um, I think I'll start with Claude this time. Claude. So, so, um, so I think like I mentioned earlier, right? Um, you need a complete ecosystem to make this work, right? Um, we, in 2015, we launched SlidePay with um, Stampic Bank Ghana. And um, immediately we realized that we needed to add the USSD channel, right? Um, and make it a, like an omni-channel platform. We realized that we needed to um, have it available on the web because it, would have, it was going to be extremely expensive and difficult for us to build for multiple platforms. I think back then you had Windows Mobile, you had um, Android, I don't know whether Symbian was still around. Like it was just, 
uh, you know, so many things that you needed to do, right? So we had to, you know, select specific channels that would make sure that um, no cost, no potential customer was disadvantaged, right? So, so you need to go with a multi-channel approach. And, and um, in our in our space too, even though we we are we are um, competing with cash, right? We don't want cash. We don't want to draw battle lines with cash immediately, right? So you also need to find a, a good way of cash entering the so like a hybrid hybrid e-commerce. So for example, could I start a transaction online, and can I complete at a bank branch? Right. I, I think that you need to, to um, provide solutions for all the personas that are going to be using your, your solution if you want it, if you want behavior to change. Yeah. I mean, COVID, COVID, I think COVID has helped us in the transactional business because it's changed behavior. Um, we, for a long time, um, were processing transactions. Um, at one of our merchants, and when the lockdown happened, everybody was like, "In you know, so a day how, how does it work? How 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 does it work? Then everybody starts to use it, and then after the restrictions are lifted, it just doesn't make sense to go queue up again, right? So COVID has helped, and um, I think it's just fast tracked what was going to happen eventually, anyway. But um, we, we, we need to make sure that we, we have all the options available and we just don't cut off the, um, the, the traditional channels. Or if we are cutting them off, we should carefully, you know, there has to be some change management that goes on in there. So, yeah. yeah I, I like the point you raised about USSD because sometimes when I attend conferences or I hear of new products and all I see is that it's an app, it's an app. You know, my question is, what happens? Are you targeting just those with smartphones? What about the customers without smartphones, with feature phones? How are we serving those customers? And I feel like everybody is rushing to develop apps, you know, without really looking. And for me, it's really important that we as Africans develop solutions for our, our people because we understand them, understand them, them better. If you allow someone to develop a solution and bring it in country, there's definitely going to be some gaps in what they perceive to be relevant and what is the, the reality on the ground. So it's important that we balance it out. We develop the products, but we also make sure that as the UNCDF and all others are saying that we leave no one behind um, and make sure that we're able to reach the last yeah. mile. Yeah, this 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 what I wanted to make. And to our earlier point, if we listen to the customers, we wouldn't just force them down one route. If you look at like these uh, um, con conferencing tools like Zoom and Teams and uh, Google Hangouts, they still have options for people to dial in, right? Because you could you could you may not have internet, right? And that's the only way for it to make sense because. Yeah. The people who are dialed in are not going to support it to be used, and it's just not going to work. So you, you definitely need to make a way. Obviously, we know it's cheaper yeah. um, to dial in on the data and all of that. So yeah, you, you can't alienate um, other other people and other actors within your 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 yeah. ecosystem. That's true. Um, well, please ask Emmanuel to go on mute. Um, um, Steve. Yeah, so um, two points. One, um, I think this is a huge opportunity for fintechs because fintechs are agile, lean. They can start things, fail faster, and innovate faster. So the fact that you go to banks, so I'll give you a simple approach uh, in Rwanda. So in Rwanda, we have a population of 12 million people. Now, if you look at the people with active bank accounts, you're looking at probably not more than 2 million people. Yet, on the flip side of it, over 9 million people have mobile phones. Now, you ask yourself, why should I, why do, does it have to be a prerequisite for me to go physically at a nearest branch to be able to access banking services? It simply doesn't make sense. Now, the other day, we we're having a conversation with people at the central bank. Digital KYC is allowed, it's a le is, is, is legal. 
But most of these banks, none of them want to do K digital KYC. So they have to visit people physical. Now, if they do so, that increases the cost of onboarding. If it increases the cost of onboarding, obviously that means services are not going to be accessible by everybody. Now, you talk to them, they have structures. It's going to take probably years for them to change that. But you have the likes of us, fintechs. So now fintechs through partnerships can create products that sort of changes the mindset or disrupts the industry in one way or the other. For me, I'm always of the idea, you don't have to make banks your enemies or telcos, no, they're actually <laughs> your, your good friends. And you just need to show them because if you show them that without you, they can't reach to a specific market segment, then they give you all the attention you might, you need. Sometimes it's even give you more than what you need. So I think it's, it comes down to us fintechs who are sort of emerging to think through. I mean, try not to repeat the same mistakes that these, you know, conventional institutions that have met. Because you, you, you have them become, they focus on probably less than 10% of the population because that's quick money, that's, you know, huge interest. But then if you look at the majority of the population, you see that if you try to build on top of all these infrastructures, very expensive ones, by the way, the telcos, the banks, and then just a very simple twist can bring these millions of people that are not being served into the system. And then if you do that, that's a huge value proposition you're giving not just to the users, but also to the broader financial service providers. So again, it comes down to ask the fintechs, because if you, if you ask the banks, that would probably you know, take years to change. But the fintechs, it's just take time, you know, think through it, talk to the people. I tell folks, leave your laptop for a minute, you know, in your room or whatever. Go out in the field, engage this. Try to understand what they need, what they want, you know, what they're struggling with. And then come back now on a drawing board and then try to think through how, what product can I create that sort of respond to these needs? And then how do I rally around all different stakeholders? You know, stakeholders, I'm looking at banks, I'm looking at development partners. You have all these development partners that have money to throw, you know, in terms of, especially if you're targeting impact, you know, and try to see how to play around with those, you know, stakeholders. And then, and I think it's doable, it's possible. We have many players that have done that. And I think that's, that's something that needs to be done. Just get out of the office, get, leave your laptop behind, go out in the field, have a good understanding of your customer needs. That's it, thank you. That's great. Okay. Okay, yeah, for me, I think I will start with um, listing out the limitations of um, adoptions of uh, digital payments and solutions in Africa. And I will say first, um, number one is government regulations and, um, and compliance issues. You know, like somebody mentioned earlier um, that in Ghana, you now have um, digital KYC. You know, compliance issues are very sensitive and uh, they go a long way in affecting uh, product adoption as regard um, digital payment solutions. And also um, another limitation that I've identified is um, accessibility and customer experience and user experience of the solutions that will launch, will launch in Africa. And how do I address these issues? So it means that the government needs to start coming up with um, good cashless policies that will drive people out of the banking laws um, to digital solutions. So when there are policies beyond uh, it means that the fintechs, the banks would have come up with very innovative solutions that would go in longer way. But you know, there will still be some people that will still know want to, and these are the people that government policies would would address. So when there are policies that um, that um, really drive digital payment adoption and solutions, we would begin to see great adoptions on these data channels. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. I think there's also a key role that financial education, financial literacy also plays in really reaching um, those that are usually excluded from financial services. Um, and I'd, just to add to the points that we made so far, um, there's a question in the chat, but that's asking whether 
There's a way by which the fintech industry can be regulated to be innovative instead of replicating the usual P2P bill payments as many entrants are doing. I don't know if um, Claude or Steve would like to answer that. Well, let me jump in first. Maybe Claude can come in after. Um, so in terms of regulation, um, I think um, there's no like a one size fit all because you have fintechs that are regulated, you have those that are not regulated. So um, what I've seen at least from the experience in Rwanda is um, sometimes the government drives, you know, the conversation of trying to understand and then maybe creating a conducive environment for fintechs to innovate. In some other places, it's the other way around, where you find now the, the startups, the, the ecosystem, they come together and then they build, they make one voice that makes too much noise to the extent of attracting the, the public's, you know, um, attention. So it, it can happen either way, but the bottom line is, um, it depends. So it's a case by a case by case basis, but um, it comes down again to I always try to put the responsibility to the entrepreneurs, for them to really know, to try to understand. So if you have a solution within a, a specific sector, it's always good to first understand your sector, do your homework before, don't build a product and then at the end you realize maybe you needed to do things differently or you needed to talk to X Y Z. And then you have to redo the whole process from scratch. So it's always good to, within the geography you're operating in, try to do your homework before and then know who, what you need to do in terms of regulation. Because we've had cases in Rwanda where companies had to shut down because maybe they're doing, I remember sometimes back when Bitcoin was a huge hit, you know, like everybody, even those that didn't know a thing about it, just, just you know, they just throw a Bitcoin, you know, word in, in their business and then all of a sudden it would become, you know, sexy and all of that. So again, do your homework, just understand the sector you're in and possibly if you can voice out your opinions through the ecosystem, if it's existing, but in some countries it's non-existent. So if it's existent, voice your opinion and then try to drop the conversation. And then if it's not, be the solution. So try to even, you could even be the one to build it. So either through the ecosystem or find out the people, you know, within the public institutions, be it the central banks or the ministers, ministries and all of that. And do your homework before. So make sure you have at least the basic understanding of your regulatory framework, you know, and, and then build on that to sort of, um, you could it could be that you want to change it so if you want to change it first integrate through what's already existing and then change from within because it's always easy to change from within as opposed to changing from outside remember i mean if if you have the muscles to fight the system you can do that but in most cases we don't as startups so it's always good to first you know integrate the already existing system be it the public or the ecosystem the, the private sector and then try to drive the conversation from there. Try to sort of influence that change that you want to see. So I think this is how I look at it. Um, other than that, it's a case, case by case basis because what I'm doing might be regulated or not. What you're doing might be or not. So it depends on the cases, but generally that's the idea. Okay, all right, great. Um, let me just move to the next question. Um, and it, it goes to maybe Adi can answer, Adi Kola can answer that. It's from Jean Paul. He's asking what are experiences in dealing with issues related to digital literacy towards an inclusive solution? So, please can you take that again? No, he's asking about, basically, asking about. Um, experiences in dealing with the issues related to digital literacy. Okay, thank you. I think that's a very wonderful question. Um, and I th if you look at the um, level of digital literacy in Africa, it's still very, very low. So it means that um, we in the banking space and fintech space, we have a lot of work to do, or we face issue on daily basis on how to educate our clients and customers on how to use some of this product. Um, so 
But um, what we try to do is to ensure that uh, we, we usually capitalize on creating uh, user-friendly solutions. And uh, in Nigeria, some of the things we've done is to go as far as even creating applications in local languages. So in our ATMs in Nigeria, you can, you can do transactions with um, Yoruba. I'm sure we are familiar with Yoruba language here, yeah, Aousa, Igbo, and some other Nigeria um, native languages. Um, and also we hold um, several seminars and uh, you know, campaigns online um, that educate people on how to use our products. And we do it in people's local languages. And most, most so we try as much as possible to put more of, more, more of our products on the USSD channel. That is very easy. So it means that you don't need access to internet to have access to our products and services. So it has, these are the things we've been doing to, uh, to balance it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think I'll let Claude, Claude, if you're can you answer this question for us? It's, ask, it's a two-part question. Um, the first one says, African fintech companies must keep up to date with the current trends and compete, sorry, just, must um, compete at a global scale and at the same time, they must be adapted to the realities in Africa where infrastructure is not as developed. Would you be able to give us um, some insights into that? How we deal with this dilemma of African fintech companies keeping up to date with global trends and competing at the global scale, and at the same time being adopted to the realities in Africa where the infrastructure is not as developed? Cloud, can I hear you? Ah, sorry, I also mute. <laughs> I'll, I'll say thank you for the question. Um, what I was saying was that um, in terms of the lack of infrastructure for global companies who are trying to enter our space here, um, they will still have to overcome the, the challenges that we have also with the infrastructure. That's number one. Um, probably where they have an advantage is their access to capital which um, money can answer a lot of things, right? So um, th that's one thing. But I, I don't think it's a problem, right? Because we, if the current trends really, if used properly or applied um, in the context of our, of our market, can actually help us solve the challenges of infrastructure. One of the key things though that I, you know, we, we, one of the key things is not to reinvent the wheel, right? At this time, with all the competition, all the saturation of all this, with all the startups in place, with the competition ha happening with those who are even regulated, it's not time to be building things from scratch. So it's important to, you know, um, keep up with the trends, to, to do a lot more literature review, to understand how technologies are being applied in other sectors and see how we can leverage them um, given our constraints of infrastructure and whatnot. So I think um, it, it, it's, it, it doesn't distract you if, if you, you are focused and the, the goal is to use these trends to solve your problems. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, so the next question is also directed at FinTech Solutions. It says that it seems the process of integrating fintech solutions with existing banks or MFIs digital platforms is a lengthy process in terms of platforms compatibility and security checks. What are your experiences with this? Um, I, okay, I, I think I'll answer that question. Yes, so so we we, we do lots of um, we we have lots of partnerships with banks, and in fact, we're integrated into 14 banks in Ghana and uh, one bank in in Cote d'Ivoire. Hey, no, sorry, not in Cote d'Ivoire, in um, Zimbabwe. And yes, it's it's a problem, right? It, it is a problem, but you know, unfortunately, there, there's not much that we can do. The good thing though is that when, once you go through this journey once, and you are providing solutions for other banks, 
you are basically going to give the next bank the same documentation that you had to struggle to prepare for the first bank, right? So it's, it's always good to take the first journey. Um, security, I, I, I think, I mean, security is important, right? Um, once, you know, we, we focus on innovation, innovation, if we can answer all the security questions or, you know, have mitigations for all the security threats as outlined by these banks. It only makes our solutions better, in my opinion. Um, the biggest challenge, in fact, I don't think is necessarily security as it is with culture, right? Here in, in a fintech, right, you're living, most fintechs, right, at least when you start out, you're living hand to mouth, right? So you don't have time to have like an extended three month, six month project of integrating, right? Now, in banks, because of their bureaucracies, and they have to, you know, get a project team put together for, in fact, there's one bank we are doing some work with right now. We are waiting for them to put together a project team, right? So, and we've been waiting for the last uh, six weeks. And so th those are some of where the challenges are. But for security, I think you just need to go the extra mile from the onset, have security at the fore of your you know, innovations and, and answer all the questions, right? Answer the compliance questions and all of that. Once you get in, the security guys are just gonna be happy that you've ticked all the boxes and then you can progress. So it's, it's a cultural issue when it comes to integration in, in our experience. Thank you. Thank you so much for the insights that you've shared. I think we're to the last question now. Um, it's saying that- Hello, hello. So if, yeah. I, if, if I may add to that, I think um, I just yeah. agree with Claude on, um, the bureaucracies and the frustration that can come in when fintechs try to integrate with banks. But, uh, well, I don't able to speak for other banks, but I think my bank, all we try to do is around integration with telcos, fintechs, and um, other players in this space is to create standardization. So we've standardized our interactions with, with top parties. And, uh, you know, so we ensure that everybody follow the same pattern so that there's no point reinventing the wheels. We've done it once, so we do we ensure that we enforce the partner to comply with our requirement. And um, with as much possible to uh, properly put it, manage it such that we follow the timelines and we ensure deployment is, is, is quick. Um, also, some of the challenges that banks also face is human resources. You know, you agree with me that in Africa, you have um, not very much skills in this technical space. So, you know, uh, where you don't have enough available technical resources around, you know, it could also be a challenge. So I think that's some of the challenges that some banks are so facing. And lastly, um, it's also um, depends on the focus of the bank. We are a digital bank and our focus is always to partner with top parties to aid to enhance revenue generation because we feel we totally agree that we in right collaborations with top parties and fintechs, uh, we can drive our revenue growth. So because of that, we put so much attention and focus in creating partnership and alliance with top parties. So because of that, we're able to uh, deploy solutions as quick as possible. That's worth wanting to know. Adekola, um, that's, that's um, um, GT Bank, right? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. I, I can attest to that. <laughs> I think in Ghana, you guys have a fintech desk. Yeah, so GT Bank is quite different. And in fact, I, in some cases, I think they are faster than us. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. That's good to know. <laughs> That's really good to know. Um, so we're to the last question now. Um, Karim wants to know, is mobile money really the game changer in Africa? And this is to Adekola. And what is to be envisaged, sorry, from banks in the digital payment space? Hello. Hello. Thank you. And I think that's a wonderful question. My quick response to that is no. And I'll tell you why. Okay, so before I tell you why, I would like to just go through the genesis of the African FinTech revolution, uh, especially with mobile money. You know, the adoption initially um, was in Kenya and now in over 30 African countries, uh, which is due to real democratization of financial services in Africa. You know, with over 66% of adults in sub-Saharan Africa lacking access to traditional bank accounts, mobile money has bridged the financial inclusion gap, bringing financial service closer to rural majority. 
who now do not need a bank account to transfer money, save, borrow, or even pay for goods and, and services. So what smart banks are doing? You know, today I've always, um, I think I've always mentioned partnerships and um, collaborations because honestly, that's just the way to go. So what smart banks are doing is just that um, fintechs, mobile money issuers, and acquirers must be part of every bank strategy, honestly. Fintechs, mobile money issuers, mobile money acquirers must be part of every smart bank strategy. It is imperative for banks to begin to see fintechs and mobile money providers as partners in order to develop digital financial services in partnership with these new players in the digital market. Like I said earlier, I said I will not agree that mobile money is a game changer. Um, I, I believe that organizations, be it banks or fintechs or techos, with the right technology platforms, the right partnerships, uh, that is meeting the rapid changes in the consumer's behaviors and diverse demands of consumers is a real game changer. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Steve, do you have anything to add to that? Did you call my name? Yes, I wanted to know if you had a view on, on that, whether mobile money is a game changer in Africa. Um, <laughs> yes and no. <laughs> um, yes, in the sense that um, mobile money, uh, at least, I don't know in West Africa, but in East Africa, mobile money has, has, is, has, is a big game changer. I mean, it has put back... <laughs> It has put back um, banks, you know, or, you know, telcos to rethink. Because if you look at the numbers, for instance, the biggest uh, mobile money operator is, is Safaricom in, in, in Kenya. If you look at what's happening to their revenues, com if you compare Voice and, and, uh, and PESA, I mean, you see that there's a huge shift in terms of what's been happening in terms of revenue. So that shows... Um, that it's going to be uh, a huge, you know, factor, at least as if you look in the next five to 10 years. And, and the thing is, um, the no bit is now saying that mobile money is an end in itself. So that's where I think I might disagree with a number of people. For me, I think mobile money just made people realize there's another way people can go about banking. So that's my thinking. And, and if you build on top of what mobile money has been able to achieve, so you have the USSC technology, you have the, um, the fact that people can leverage feature phones, you know, and, and without necessarily waiting for fiber cables to go through uh, all the villages in Africa and just rely on 2G, which is USSC technology. So this is where I see it as a game changer, but then on the flip side of it, fintechs, uh, banks, and telcos, they still have to innovate to create products that sort of, you know, match the needs of the people. So that's where I see that we need to do a lot of work on. For instance, I give you an example. If you look at the uptake of insurance in Africa, I don't know, in this part of the continent in East Africa, it's still below. So people are pretty much, you know, using mobile money for just you know, remittances, you know, cash in, cash out, send money. So we, we need now to think of ways to now utilize mobile money for as other services, such as, you know, um, insurance products, for instance. We have uh, in Rwanda now, we're starting to see micro insurance products, you know, tech ship, you know, where, whereby premiums are very much discounted at the level of that somebody in the village with their own cow can be able to afford. So these are the, the products that are needed to be able now to leverage the technology of mobile money and you know, to change you know, how services are being consumed you know, from a broader you know, perspective. So that's what I think. It's a yes and no. It's a yes to the sense that it has you know, changed the perception of many players within the industry. But the no that it's not just enough in itself. There's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of partnerships, in terms of value added services, in terms of you know, the regulatory framework, how do you adapt the regulatory framework to sort of you know, meet the demands or the, the dynamics of mobile money? So that's, uh, in, a, in a few words, that's my take on that. 
Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. We have mm -hmm. one last question, Claude. This one is specifically for you. Um, sorry, Emma, I, I just yes. wanted to make a point on, on, on the other one, right? Okay. Um, so I, I, I see mobile money organizations or mobile money financial services as a threat to, to fintechs, right? Um, they currently are doing exactly what Steve said. Like they, they, they are just, a, a, what you call it? A, they're just uh, they're just being used for remittances, right? So cash in, cash out at the other end, right? But recently, I've noticed a trend where now they are entering into you know fintech type spaces where they are you know pushing mobile apps, they are having open APIs and stuff like that. And it's something that we need to to pay attention to because these guys have lots of money. Right, and also a very interesting trend. So for example, the, the mechanic that works on my car, as an example, I see him on posting the WhatsApp statuses, the cleaners in our office have WhatsApp statuses, the security, office, um, security guys, you know, so, so you can see with the influx of um, uh, cheap uh, Chinese, Chinese Android phones and stuff like that, um, this, uh, you know, sort of the, the space that the fintech guys have been playing in is, is, is being encroached on, right? Um, and, and so I just wanted to throw that out there to, uh, to add to the conversation, yeah. But um, it only means that, at least for me, our partnership fintechs with banks, we shouldn't let them come and dominate this space. I hope there are no <laughs> mobile money people on this call, <laughs> all right. Very interesting. I don't know if he's on the platform. I'll check and let you know. <laughs> but um, yeah, um, we have a lot of a few more questions. Um, Claude, I just have to send this one to you, and if you can just give us a very short answer to this. Robert wants to know how politics is affecting digital money in Ghana and Africa at large. Yeah, I mean, so uh, okay, how is it affecting? Um. So a, a couple of things. I mean, you know, we, we operate in um, Zimbabwe, right? And um, it's interesting how the currency, you know, drops, right? <laughs> so it, it, it really impacts um, the, you know, forecasting and whatnot. So, so that, again, I mean, to politics, um, you know, one, one would hope that they, they, would, they would get a grip on the, what you call the economy, right? Um, in terms of in, in Ghana, there's also the regulation. I think yeah, it was yeah, it was a, an act passed by the uh, uh, the government um, to regulate fintechs. Um, it, it's, it was a bit scary when it started out. Initially, they said um, fintechs needed to bring 30 million CDs. I think that's about six million dollars um, to deposit at Bank of Ghana, um, and then over the period, we negotiated with them, and it came down to two million CDs. Um, which is about uh, five hundred thousand um, dollars. So, so it, it it was just not contained, right? If 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 we didn't, you know, come together as a as a a, a sector to to you know negotiate with these guys, we would have been given de dealt a raw hand, right? So we need to be careful about politics, and um, it does have its impact on us. And in in Ghana, you know, there's a general drive for digitization, which is good. So, you know, we'll just all surf that wave, right? But if they were against digitization, that again would have been a problem. So, and now of course there's politics, right? So we also try to enter into other African countries and the stability of the, the, the um, country is very important to us also working there, safety of our staff and all that kind of thing. So, so yes, it does have an impact on what's possible. So on the policy side, the political side, um, you know, those who are in that space have to create a, a stable environment for, for the rest of us to, to thrive and yeah. Thank, thank you. you. I think I have anything to add to that and then see if Steve has um, some insights to share from Rwanda as well. Um, what was the question again, please? Um, so, the question from Robert Ando was, how is politics affecting digital money in Ghana and Africa at large? So we just wanted to hear your perspective on that. Yeah, I mean, I feel like I heard uh, what uh, Clark just said, I, and I agree with him 100%, is, I mean, we're, we're entrepreneurs, so we are, you know, business-driven. And 
if you could do as much as you can to avoid the politics is it's always the ideal you know but avoid getting involved but at least be informed <laughs> so that you can strategize better and then know you know the moves to make but obviously because you don't want to take sides you know because that can you know affect your business but be informed at least know what's going on what's happening you know but try not to sort of um, get involved you know in politics because it might create a conflict of interest so i think that's it and and, and also you know be informed be it in your country or in other geographies where you want to um to expand your business into but also when looking for partnerships you know it's also good to be aware of the, the pros and the cons and you know at least you know be be cautious you know that's that's what i can say about it and yeah but you still need to be informed about everything that's going on so that you you won't be caught by surprise you know if something happens yeah, yeah. that's great thank you nicola any final words on that okay um i totally agree with what i've been said earlier and um, I don't operate in Ghana, so I don't so much. I don't. I don't really have an um, idea of what operates in Ghana environment. But I would um, give. I would look at Cote d'Ivoire, and um, what I see right now is that government is not supporting digital solutions as much as they should do. So I feel the policies around um, cashless environment is not adequate. Um, so practically, that I would say is what is affecting. Um, the digital adoption generally in the Côte d'Ivoire market. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our last question is, what is the future of telecommunication, banking, and fintech, especially for the rural um, and financially excluded, if I should put it that way? Anyone would like to just... Um, give us their thoughts on the future of telecommunication, banking and fintech for the rural and financially excluded. Um, I, I think um, for the, for this particular question, um, the, that future is a bright one if all the players collaborate. So the telcos, the, the, the banking industry and the fintech industry collaborate to, to, to um, uh, support the, the financially excluded, right? Um, because the, there is some infrastructure that the telcos have that would need to leverage and it's infrastructure that they put in decades ago that we need to leverage. It doesn't make sense for us to go um, recreate that infrastructure will cost too much money that is not available. Um, so I think collaboration is, is the way forward. But at some point we're going to collaborate. At some point I think there'll be mergers because um, th that, that's the only way to, to defeat uh, cash. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. So um, the last point was that um, Etel Tigo, Venus wanted us to know that Etel Tigo was the first player to offer insurance um, using mobile money and data top up. So at this point, I think we've had a great session. We've learned a lot from our panelists. I have so many notes, I don't know where to start from. But I think the key thing is that collaboration is important. Um, the more we collaborate, the better we'll be able to ensure that we leave no one behind. And also we need to have in mind um, to develop products that really meet the needs of customers and also to really do a lot of insights into the products that we are offering. We've also learned not to to stay neutral when it comes to politics, not to align with any political party, but be informed of the political situation in your country or any other country you intend to operate in. So I've learned a lot. I'd like to say a big thank you to our honorable panelists, Claude, Adekola, and Steve, for all the wonderful insights you've given us today. We wish you the very best in your various endeavors, and thank you once again.